This video is sponsored by Movie Palette. Hello and welcome to Projector at the London Film Festival. And on this episode, Daniel Craig is back on the case as Benoit Blanc in another all-star mystery from Ryan Johnson in the sequel to Knives Out, Glass Onion. In May 2020, tech billionaire Miles Braun, played by Edward Norton, has invited his close friends and disruptors to his private Greek island and his glass onion estate, including scientist Lyle Troussant, played by Leslie Odom Jr., politician Claire Dubella, played by Catherine Hahn, supermodel and fashion designer Birdie J, played by Kate Hudson, and a beleaguered assistant Peg, played by Jessica Henwick, Twitch streamer Duke Cody, played by Dave Batista, and his girlfriend Whiskey, played by Madeline Klein, and Miles' ex-business partner Cassandra Andy Brand, played by Janelle Monet. Also showing up on the island is Detective Benoit Blanc, played by Daniel Craig, who has somehow received a mysterious invitation of his own. Miles has brought them together for a murder mystery weekend, but the game is about to turn into deadly reality, and Blanc is the only one who can solve it. Glass Onion is, of course, the sequel to Knives Out, which back in 2019 grossed $311 million at the worldwide box office, which made it the most successful original movie released that year. Knives Out definitely capitalised on our resurgence of murder mysteries and our pop culture, including a slew of recent Agatha Christie adaptations and renewed interest in shows like Columbo and Murder, She Wrote. During the pandemic, a number of streamers, including Amazon, Apple, and Netflix, all competed to try and buy the rights to the sequels to Knives Out, away from Lionsgate, who distributed the first film theatrically. Netflix was the winner, with an eye-watering $469 million bid for two sequels. So that means that this follow-up is largely jumping cinemas onto streamers streaming, although it is getting a one-week theatrical release, largely as a concession to cinemas because the original was such a big hit, but also to promote the release of it at Christmas time on Netflix. Daniel Craig and Ryan Johnson are of course back for this entry, but this time they've got a brand new ensemble cast. This was actually the closing night film at the London Film Festival, so I actually really wanted to go and see it, but unfortunately the press show is at 8.30 in the morning and it's impossible to get into London that early by train, so I end up doing an overnight stay in Bristol and seeing it at the watershed, and on that day, it was absolutely tipping it down with rain, so I got completely soaked on my walk down from the station. So I spent two and a half hours watching the movie in completely sodden, drenched clothes. Was it worth it? Yeah, actually. It kind of was. Oh, and before you say anything, this is a non-spoiler review. Before the film started, Ryan Johnson appeared in a brief clip asking the audience to not spoil the movie, especially given that we were seeing it so early. And the screen was accompanied by a host of fairly burly security guards, making sure no one was filming any of it on their phones. I'm going to concede to Johnson's request, although most of the projector reviews on this channel are non-spoiler, because I tend to talk more about theme rather than direct plot points. But if you're super duper cautious, you might not want to watch this review before you see the movie, but most of the things I am talking about in it are all things that are established very early on. There are things that I do want to talk about in Glass Onion which are specific and spoilery, but I am making a separate video on those. There will be a spoiler special that will be released on the channel at Christmas time when the movie drops on Netflix, and then everyone see it by that point so they can all come back and see my fuller thoughts on the movie. Although if you're a Patreon, you can see that early. Sound good? Great. Let's get started. The best way of describing Glass Onion is that it's knives out but bigger. It takes the first film and plays it on a much grander scale, specifically on a Greek island. If the first film took aim at American conservatism, then this is taking its pot shots at the 1%. Although, when you think about it, that is kind of a lateral move. That means that we spend a lot of time in the company of Miles Braun, played by Edward Norton, who is having an absolute whale of a time getting to send up Elon Musk Musk and similar entrepreneurs, but mostly a lot of Musk. This is someone that wants to leave a lasting legacy and impact on the world, although that could also be a way of describing the fact that he wants to control the world in his own image. The glass onion of the title refers to several things in the movie, but it refers partially to the mansion and the observatory deck 
of it specifically, which is shaped like a glass onion. And that has very personal significance to Miles. But also, there is more metaphorical meaning to the title as well. But nevertheless, we spend a lot of time in this mansion where he's just got this enormous amount of just money on display. And it feels like the film does as well, although ironically enough, it does actually have the same $40 million budget as the first movie did, but it just weirdly feels like it's so much bigger this time out, even though some of it is actually more self-contained because we spend more time on this island than we did in the house in the first movie. And onto this island, he's assembled his closest acquaintances, or as he likes to call them, his disruptors. They've all been friends for a very long time, and he has played a crucial role in each of their individual successes. So in that way, they are indebted and loyal to him, but also they are manifestations of his control and influence over the world in terms of power and politics, he uses them to get his message out into the wider spectrum. So in that way, he not only has control over this inner circle, but also uses them as a way of disrupting the rest of the world and changing it to fit his own image. And so he has invited them to this island to essentially just tell him how brilliant he is. And the only one that sees through this is Cassandra. She and Miles are not on the best terms, given they've had a very high profile falling out. One character compares her to Eduardo in the social network. So a lot of the guests are actually quite surprised to even see her there on the island, given that she's been effectively excommunicated out of Miles's inner circle. But that means that she's free to call things like they are, and pointing out that this whole arrangement is parasitical and self-aggrandizing in Miles's favor. And also, if that Miles can betray her, that means that any one of them could be betrayed by Miles if they fall prey to his whims. And that means that each of the guests have their own potential motive if they wanted to take power for themselves from either each other or from Miles. And Jamel Monet is absolutely fantastic in this role. It is a part that has a lot of layers to it and is very complex and she is key to the movie. And that's all that I will say about that. The ensemble cast is absolutely brilliant from top to bottom, each giving bold, dynamic comic performances, but some of them get to steal the show more than others. Kate Hudson is absolutely hysterical as model Birdie J in perhaps one of her best roles in years. The character is a total controversy magnet. She's always getting cancelled and having to apologise for things that she didn't know she was offending people over, which becomes a very amusing running gag, especially as it gets more and more egregious. And Miles has helped her open a fashion brand. The character is so stupid and self-absorbed that you can't actually hate her because she's that clueless. In fact, it's really amusing how the first time we meet this character, she's holding a massive house party. I remind you that the movie is set in the early months of the pandemic. Ah, uh, they're all in my bubble. Again, showing how ignorant this character is, the first time she actually shows up to the island, she's wearing a mesh mask over her face, which of course is completely useless. And Hudson has loads and loads of great moments with Jess Henwick, who plays her assistant Peg, who is always trying to help out her boss and has to put up with all the mistakes that she keeps on making. She's essentially the only one that is keeping her boss out of trouble most of the time. And Henwick and Hudson are just brilliant Yeah, There's one scene involving a crucial revelation involving Hudson's character that brought the house down at my screening. It was that funny. The other delight in the cast is Dave Batista, who has really grown to a great character actor with solid comic instincts. He plays Duke 
Cody and is very well cast. The character is an MRA type, constantly going on about alpha males or some such. The whole time he's doing overcompensatory masculinity as well as he should be, given that he in reality still lives with his mother despite the macho facade. But the entire time he just feels the need to show off, like bring a gun to the iron completely unnecessarily. And he's come there with his girlfriend Whiskey, played by Madeline Klein, who is not really in a relationship with him so much as he just uses her as a prop in his videos when he's spouting his misogyny. And it's a character that the movie uses to really viciously send up these types. And you can tell that Batista has the same level of contempt for these kind of people and really goes for it. And then in the midst of all this, you drop Benoit Blanc, played once again by Daniel Craig, who looks like he's having the time of his life getting to reprise this role. He clearly had so much fun on the first movie getting to play the anti-Bond and hide behind this exaggerated caricature, complete with a Kentucky Fried Foghorn Leghorn Southern accent that the character has. The character is as much a sender for those kind of Praro types as he is an embodiment of them. Like in the first movie, Blanc is an outsider, but unlike in that first movie, where I'd actually argue that Marta is the main character of it, Blanc is the centre of attention for a lot of Glass Onion, especially because his presence on the island is one of the film's big mysteries in of itself. He shows up and even Miles is surprised to see him there because now this murder mystery weekend has the world's greatest detective in its company. And if Miles builds himself and his friends as disruptors, then Blanc is is a disruptor to his murder mystery weekend. And Craig actually plays it a lot bigger this time out. At some points, I did think that Craig was actually going quite broad. And then it turned out that that was actually kind of a little bit deliberate. That's how smart the film really is. But again, like in the first movie, this is an ensemble film, so Blanc does actually cede a lot of the focus, especially as the film goes forward, and so he is more of an instigator than really a full proper protagonist, and I think that's going to be Blanc's role in continued entries in this series. Ryan Johnson's script and direction continues to be very strong, even with a much larger scope this time out. It feels like Johnson is in full control of everything on screen, and given the longer running time, it allows him a lot more room to breathe. It allows us more time with all the characters to establish their relationships and their personalities and set all the wheels in motion. It's actually quite a long while before the whodunit element actually comes to the forefront, but it's very deliberate that way. And once the game is actually afoot, you realise that Johnson has constructed something even more elaborate than the first time out. And there are plenty of twists and surprises that will go completely unhinted at here because they're best left completely unspoiled. But suffice to say, if you think you know the game, it turns out that Johnson has a completely different one for you. In fact, the opening sequence of the movie where each of the disruptors gets a special package from Miles, which is an elaborate set of puzzles leading to an invitation at the center of it, is pretty much meant to be a metaphor for the entire movie itself. It is puzzles on top of puzzles, layers on top of layers. The film is fiendishly clever. It's also very, very funny. Knives Out was hysterical. It was brilliantly written. There was loads of quotable dial. Glass Onion is even funnier than the first movie. In fact, the audience that I saw it with was in hysterics the whole time. I think that Glass Onion might be one of the best comedies in the last decade. It is really in full control of its audience the entire time. And I think that shows the strength of Johnson, both in terms of his writing and in his direction. The movie just sweeps you up in it almost from the moment go. It is just so 
entertaining. And again, because the movie has so many different constructions to it, like the first film, you can actually revisit it. It is a problem with a lot of whodunits where if you know the answer, there isn't really that much to go back to. But trust me, Glass Onion has plenty of things to keep you amused. And while we're on the subject of the film's production, I've got to give a big shout out to costume designer Jenny Egan, whose outfits are as much a star of the show as the actors themselves, pretty much turning them into clue versions of the characters. Each one has an individual distinctive look about them. Of course, they were very noticeable in the first movie as well, which had a very strong autumnal look about it. Particularly, Chris Evans is much commented upon knitwear, which some people might have tried to emulate. Of course, with the change in setting in this one, we get a completely different look, which is much more summary, but you can really see this in the character of Blanc, who gets some very idiosyncratic clothing choices over the course of the movie. And again, those are really fun. I feel like there are times where even the costumes raise a laugh by themselves, particularly one very distinct moment where Blanc chooses a very particular kind of swimwear to go to the pool with. In terms of the film's humour, the movie is very pointedly set during the pandemic and you can tell that it was written and made during it too because a lot of the preoccupations that we had during that period of time are satirised in the movie. The central conceit of it is of course inspired by reports of the super rich going to their private islands and inviting their friends to get together so that they can have a normal time as opposed to the rest of us plebs. And so the movie is very savage and vicious in its commentary on that. But you've also got other things like there is a running gag about celebrity endorsed products which is clearly inspired by a certain app that became a bit of a laughing stock over the course of the pandemic. This leads into a bit of a criticism that I might potentially have about Glass Onion in that the movie is such a product of that period of time that I'm not sure how well the movie will age. It's certainly cathartic to see those things on screen and they're hilariously done. I'm just wondering if it's a little bit too connected to that point in time, unlike Knives Out, which, yes, was a product of the Trump era, but even so, that movie didn't feel like it was so distinctly locked into the period of time in which it was made and set as Glass Onion is. So I do wonder how well the movie will play in the coming years. I also feel like Johnson is having to walk a very, very fine line with regards to the film's tone, because obviously the movie is commenting on the extravagance and indulgence of its characters, and especially Miles, but it's also something that the movie itself has become bigger and more bloated because of it, and I feel like the movie could potentially fall victim to its own success. It could become self-indulgent. I don't think Glass Onion completely surrenders to that, but certainly the thing that made me ponder this were the film's cameos. There is a lot of cameos in Glass Onion, and you can understand why, because the first film was so popular everyone wants to get in on the joke. And some of them are quite funny, and some of them are poignant because they're posthumous, and I believe that a dedication is being added to later runs of this movie in regards to that. But even so, I do feel like these cameos kind of remind me of sort of later era Simpsons where they might be a little bit distracting and I do wonder if this might be something that becomes a problem going forward if this becomes further franchise. But this isn't really to do with Glass Onion but me putting a pin in the future so that if I come back in a few years and this is an issue in a further sequel I can say yeah this kind of started here. But this is me really nitpicking because overall Glass Onion is a great time. Glass Onion is so immensely entertaining that even though I was in a rotten mood going into it, I still came out with a smile on my face. I don't think that this is better than the first Knives Out. I think it's equal to it. There are some things that the first movie did better, but there's also a lot of things that Glass Onion does better than Knives Out, and it's funnier 
than the first movie. There is even more quotable, quippy dialogue. There is even more ingenious setups. There is even more mind-bending twists. It's basically a bigger, bolder, flashier riff on the first movie, but Johnson has enough control over it to keep it from collapsing in on itself, and Johnson is at the height of his powers in this movie. This is a really great sequel, and I think that Knives Out has plenty of room for more follow-ups. In fact, I would be very happy to see them. You've probably spent the whole video going, what's that great piece of art in the background? Well, it's no mystery. It's a movie palette. Imagine your favourite movie as a piece of art. But look closer, because each of these lines represents scenes or sequences from the movie. And also, if you look even closer, you can actually tell what movie it is at the bottom. In this case, it's Terminator 2 Judgment Day. And if you'd like one of your own, I've got a clue for you. Go to moviepalette.com and use the code FILMBRAIN15 to get 15% off your order. And then you can invite your friends to look closer. If you like this review and you want to support my work, you can give me a tip at my Ko-fi page or my YouTube Super Thanks feature, which is right below the video, or you can buy some of my merch from my T Public page, or you can solve the puzzle at my Patreon, where you can see my videos early among other perks, including access to the spoiler section for this video and access to my Discord server, or you can simply like, share, and subscribe. Those all help as well. Until next time, I'm Matthew Buck, fading out.